Welcome, friends, to a Text to Connect British Columbia event. But of course, you can come in from anywhere in the world, and we're delighted to have you here. I'm Eli. I'm one of your local Text to Connect hosts. And this is part of a, a global network of Tech for Good chapters run by local volunteers. The topic is using digital tools for health behavior change. And I brought in some really smart, clever people who have done some very interesting work at scale using digital interventions to actually change behaviors and health outcomes. So our presenters today are Saiji John, who is a results-driven performance marketing specialist with over eight years of experience. Most recently, Saiji led the digital media strategy at Girl Effect, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering girls and young women through their journey. And she's now working with Julie at Catholic. And as for Julie, Julie is a partner at Catholic Communications, which is a communications practice that helps organizations do exceptional and original marketing. At Catholic, they believe that to truly thrive, nonprofits and social enterprises need to experiment and be innovative because the problems we're tackling are just too big for us to come at it with boring standard approaches. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to today's expert. It's really nice to be here today. It's been a little while since I have participated in one of these events. I'm just excited to be back. And I want to thank you for the invitation to be here. We are going to talk today about using digital tools for health behavior change. And that is a whole lot of fancy language for using tools to get people to be healthier, to make some good choices. We are going to cover a few different things on today's session. We're going to... Second. Yeah. We're going to talk about SBCC. What does SBCC mean? You're about to find out. We're going to talk about chatbots. As I'm going to talk about brand lift studies, which are a kind of particular tool that is a little bit more sophisticated, but can teach us a lot about our campaigns, about our messaging, about whether or not what we're doing is really working. I'm going to talk about some do-it-yourself versions of surveying, polling, and brand lift studies. And then we're going to have lots of time for questions. So I really would invite you to put some questions in the chat as we go. And I think we'll do a question uh, kind of section at the end. But if you have questions about the specific case studies or the tools that we're sharing, feel free to put them in chat and we can answer as we go. Eli already did a lovely introduction, but just on a little bit more of a personal note, I'm going to introduce Saiju and she's going to introduce me. So as Eli said, Saiju has been running health behavior change campaigns for global nonprofits for more than a decade. Her areas of passion are data analysis and making impact for behavior change. And she's new to Vancouver. She also speaks three languages which is always impressive tidbit for me. I think I'm at about like 1.25. And if she wasn't already a communicator, she would be a clinical psychologist, which makes a ton of sense to me because sometimes running communications campaigns requires a deep dive into human psychology. So Saiju is new working with me at Capulet and it is an absolute pleasure to have her as a colleague. Saiju, I'll let you do a little introduction as well. Yeah, thank you, Julie. And this is actually my second time being a host here for Texto this year. So I'm really excited to be back. And just want to just take a second to introduce Julie. Julie is the founding member of Capulet. For 20 years, Julie and her team have designed high impact marketing campaigns that are making a positive impact in the world. So from pro, pro vaccine campaigns to building a blanket fort in downtown Vancouver, Julie's creativity for each campaign centers around one question. How can we make this remarkable? Now, fun fact about Julie, she's a certified figure skating coach. It's true. If I wasn't a marketer, 
that may be my, that may be my, have been my day today, which would have been a lot colder and many more early mornings. So let's start with what is SBCC, which is a mouthful. It means social and behavior change communications. I would love to see if this is a term that you're familiar with. So if you could type just like a plus one into chat, if you've heard this term before, that would be really interesting to me. I'd like to, I'd like to know if that's uh, you've seen before. New term. Yeah. It was relatively new to me as well before I started doing this work really in 2019, 2020. Yeah, it is a mouthful, but really it's a term that as you start to work with health campaigns, you'll see pretty often it, its framework and strategies are really based in behavior science and it focuses on changing knowledge, attitude, attitude, sorry, knowledge. Let's go again. Knowledge, attitude, and ultimately behaviors. So this is critical for improved public health outcomes. Often when we're thinking about marketing, we're thinking about getting attention, improving awareness, but we don't always think about engaging around changing and shifting attitudes and behavior. So that's really the core of SBCC. And a key strategy of social behavior change communication is to normalize healthy behaviors within a target audience. And that's often what we're trying to do when we're running health campaigns is we're trying to normalize healthy behaviors. So there's a ton of resources online that can help you become more familiar with SBCC strategies, messaging tactics, lots of really interesting things to investigate further. If you do a little Google for SBCC, you'll, you'll see that happens. You ha can get sucked into this giant rabbit hole of SBCC communications, which is actually pretty fun and interesting. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, today, we're going to highlight like, tools that you can use to understand your target audience better, which is critical to running health campaigns and also to delivering programs and making sure that your campaigns are actually working. So the tool we're going to talk about is the chatbot, which I know lots of you have encountered and already know a little bit about. But Sanchi is going to take us through a couple of examples of chatbots being used for health. Thank you, Julie. So one of my longest and most recent work instances is with an organization called Girl Effect. And I'll be pulling my examples from here a lot. At Girl Effect, one way of reaching out to the audience is through chatbots. It, Girl Effect right now has three different chatbots for three different countries. So there is Big Sis for South Africa, there is Bol Behan for India, and then there's Wazi for Kenya. So how does this organization use chatbots to affect behavior change? We all know that young audience across countries prefer texting. It's more convenient. It's more private. People would rather text than get on a call. And these are the behaviors that we wanted to hone in. Hone in. These chatbots created by Girl, Girl Effect are smart chatbots that answer questions that young women have. This could be about their bodies. It could be relationship questions. It could be life in general. It could also be about mental health. And we all know that we have these questions that we want answered. Now, Big Sis in South Africa and Bol Behan in, in India are virtual big sisters that the audience can reach out to and get their questions answered. And the tone that we use within this chatbot is just like a big sister, or should I say a good big sister, where it's understanding and it's non-preachy non and it's non-judgmental. And these big sisters can be reached through WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. For big sis in South Africa, in conversation and in the chat flows, we have incorporated various services that we signpost the audience to. And these are health services. So we have partners like Marie Stopes. We have a helpline. We have a service called Lifeline and a few other health services that we, we want to integrate very naturally into the chat flows. In South Africa, we've got about 100,000 young women who have used Big Sis and, we have, and they have engaged with the chatbot. We have about 1.2 million messages that were exchanged within the chatbot and these numbers are still growing. Now, from the success of Big Sis as a chatbot in South Africa, Girl Effect then created Bol Behin, translating to Say Sister or Tell Sister. The audience 
here are young women between the ages of 18 to 24. The location is the Hindi belt. So it's 11 states in India which constitute the Hindi belt. We use English as a language within the chatbot, which is essentially Hindi, but it's written in English. We signpost to various medical services here as well. So we have services like Prev, we have Medibuddy, Childlike, Jagori. And these are services that the audience can avail either in person or they can uh, do it online. And they, they, there are also options like tele-counseling services. Bolbehan has seen over 115,000 conversations initiated and over 1 million messages exchanged within the chatbot. And, and at Girl Effect, there's an entire team that's managing the technical portions of the chatbot, ensuring that there are no bugs, there are no flags, that the audience are getting the answers that they need, that the chatbot is not breaking up. And they also invested a lot of time in incorporating NLP, which is natural language processing, to ensure that the chats are very natural to the audience and it does not come across robotic. There are also content teams that are dedicated to consistently improving the chat flows and get, getting the feedback from girls who are using the bot. If we could skip to the next slide, Julie. Yeah, and there's also a question here that I think is interesting one, and that is around AI. There's a question about whether these are AI generated, and then also, are, are you just using Hinglish, like just Hinglish as like a one language, or are there multiple language options? With the brand in India, we only target the Hindi speaking belt, so we only use Hinglish as a language. So that's just in India. For South Africa, we do use English, but it's got a lot of these slangs that people in South Africa relate to. So we adapt our language to the audience by working with teams in the country to build this out. And the second question was the AI generated. Yes, these are AI generated chatbots. But again, we have a whole team who's working on the technical portion of it. And for though that level of information, I would have to get back with like details about it. But it is AI generated chatbots. Okay. To understand how a chatbot would be used as a tool for digital change, I popped this diagram in of how we design the conversation within one of the chatbots. So once a girl comes to the chatbot, she's first onboarded, which essentially means she goes through the terms and conditions and she's been she gives she's given a link to the data and privacy policy. So once she's in, she can choose between the various topics of conversation within the chatbot. So it could be about sex, it could be about love, it could be relationship or straight up, she could just say, I want a doctor, doctor. Now with the last option, she's directly taken to the list of services we signpost to. Now with the first few options, the chat flow is designed to bring out any preconceived notions she may have about these topics. So now one of the most important thing is to get rid of the idea that talking about sex or your bodies is taboo. And that is what the one nice thing about using a chatbot because it's a private one-on-one -on -one conversation that you can have with the audience. The chatbot then provides her information about this topic based on her responses and then follows up by asking, do you want to understand more? Do you want more information or have you understood this okay? Then comes the first nudge. Does she want to go to a doctor? Now, in many places, we know that young women are often afraid to go to a doctor. She's afraid of the judgments she could face if, if, say, she's had sex. Or she's afraid that the doctor would notify her parents. Or she's even afraid that someone would see her walking to a clinic and then make assumptions on her character. So if she needs to go to a doctor and has, a, has, has an answer that's not, yes, I want to talk to a doctor, it could be, yes, but I'm afraid. Then the chatbot then prepares her to go to the doctor. This could be about this could be just telling her about the services that we offer, that we signpost to, are vetted by us. It could be telling her that the doctors are non-judgmental and they would not be reaching out to her parents in case she's had sex. And even showing her the interviews that we have done with these certain doctors. So once we're able to remove this hesitancy that she has, saying they're going to judge me, if we remove that hesitancy, we're able to lead her to the services where she can either meet with the doctor or take an online appointment and, and meet with them. And that's the journey within the chatbot. From, from the time that we've had these chatbots out in live, I've added some of the feedbacks that we have received for, for our chatbots where we have heard young girls really relating to a virtual big sister. 
And even going so so far to say that the information that they received here through this chatbot, they've not even received it in school. Okay. From over to you, Julie. Yeah. But before we move on, I'm just uh, curious if you were going to recommend that an organization consider a chatbot as a communications tool. What would you say in terms of how much like work? It is return on investment. <laughs> if you're a small organization, is this something that's viable or is it really more of an organization that would need to have a lot of technical support? Where does a chatbot kind of fit on the scale of nonprofit work, do you think? Yeah, I think with the, a lot of AI tools that's available now, it is become more and more accessible to people and to organizations to build out their own chatbot. But having said that, I would say that it is an investment. It is a lot of time and effort that goes into it from deciding the objective of a chatbot to deciding the flows, to do, to getting the content in place, doing a lot of te testing because it's always bugs, right? So to doing all of that, there is a lot of time and effort that goes into building out the chatbot. But having said that, using a chatbot is really effective because you can see individually what the questions are coming through from the audience. We can tailor our messages uh, based on how the audience are responding. So it is a really effective tool, it, but it also gets a, a lot of time and investment into it. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I think Christopher has noted here that Microsoft has a generative AI chatbot and that is just getting increasingly cheaper and easier to do. I'm sure that there's a whole conversation about AI and health and how that all can be done safely as part of this. But chatbots are like just increasingly getting easier and, and less expensive. If you're in the business of sharing a lot of information with people who have questions, whether that's about health or something else, um, a chatbot is a really interesting tool to consider. That's right. I'm actually adding a list of tools that people can access. I've got about four with me, so I've added that in the chat as well. Great. Thank you, Sajay. Okay, so we're going to move from chatbots to a brand lift study. And a brand lift study, which I'm going to refer to as a BLS, is a more sophisticated tool. It measures whether or not your content has positively shifted or listed, that's where the list comes from, your audience's knowledge, attitudes, or behaviors towards a topic. So the reason why we're talking about a brand lift study for health behavior change is because it is a way of measuring attitudes and knowledge and the shift there so that it relates very well to kind of SBCC principles. A BLS, a brand lift study, is a research product and it's offered by market research agencies like Nielsen. It's also offered by social media platforms like Meta and YouTube. And there is a catch. And the catch is that you have to spend enough money in ads for your campaign on the social platform to achieve statistically significant results. And so depending on where in the world you're running your campaign, the cost will change dramatically. But for many organizations, really, it means that you're going to ha have to spend about $30,000 in advertisements for your campaign in order to get access to a brand list study. Now, that is a giant chunk of change <laughs> for many organizations. So um, one way around that is to do a little bit of research and to see if Meta or YouTube are running any social impact programs that align with your work. Um, if so, there are often opportunities to receive ad credits for platforms to promote your campaigns. So some of the examples of BLS results that we'll share today were funded by ad credits handed out to health organizations at the height of the pandemic. So that's just something to keep in mind that there often are programs that are running that are aligned with the work that you do, and you can find ways to get free ad credits through some of these platforms. So maybe put that on your list of like potential funding opportunities as well. Also, don't worry, we are going to talk about affordable options as well. But understanding how a BLS works is actually a useful 
thing when considering measurement tools, specifically for health campaigns. There are three key components to a brandless study. The first is randomized groups. BLS will automatically put your target audience into either an exposed or also called a treatment group that sees your campaign content, or they'll, the BLS will put your target audience into a control group that doesn't see it. The tool does that automatically. It takes your target audience and divides it up and says, we're going to show these people your campaign through advertisements, and we're not going to show these people your campaign. After enough content exposure for the treatment group, the folks who see your campaign, both groups get delivered polls. So on the, this slide, you might recognize a poll like this from your face, Facebook feed. It's unlikely that you have seen health polls because the vast majority of brandless studies in Facebook or Instagram are for brands, hence the term brandless study. But often you'll see one of these polls will come to you and it'll say, have you purchased from a brand, KitchenAid, within the last three months? Or have you seen an ad for KitchenAid within the last three days? So now that you see this, if you haven't been seeing this on your feed, I promise you're going to see it all the time. And that is a brand look steady poll. So the poll then measures whether or not the group that was exposed to your ads has achieved um, more positive lift in health knowledge, attitudes, or behaviors than the control group that was not exposed at all to your campaign. So if your campaign created a list in the brand lift study, then that would signal a successful campaign. Um, you'll note that I say signal there, and that's because our campaigns are obviously not run in a vacuum. So other campaigns, current events, all kinds of things can influence poll answers and how people feel about a topic, especially a topic like health. But, but it's probably the closest tool we have to be able to determine whether or not you're seeing attitude change. So I'm going to pass back to Saiju, who's going to tell us a little bit about a brand lift study that she ran for COVID prevention and that she worked on during the pandemic. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, so during the pandemic, we designed a campaign with Meta to reach young women in South Africa between the ages of 18 and 24. The campaign objective was to talk to young women about safety steps during COVID-19. And these were actions including mask wearing, social distancing, and hand washing. The total campaign budget allotted for this brand of study, and as Julie said, it is quite expensive. So the budget allotted for this was $74,000 in the way of ad credits. Now, the question we wanted to ask the audience as a way of polling were, in the last two days, how often did you wear a mask in public? We asked how important it is to wash your hands with soap after being in public how important it is to keep sufficient distance between people when you're socializing. We also did like a multiple choice question where we asked which of the following actions will slow the spread of COVID-19 where we wanted participants to select all that applied. And we also had that standard question with every brand lift study that you do with Meta. Do you recall seeing a post with this messaging by this brand in the last two days? Now, this question is really important because this measures how impactful your ads have been and if the ads have stayed in the minds of your audience. Now, this campaign was done in the initial phase of COVID, where the vaccines have not yet rolled out. These preventative measures and actions were the main message of, from this brand to our audience. Where, while we were sure that our audience were knew about these measures through various PSAs from other health organizations and governments, we wanted to make sure that they knew that they are supposed to implement these actions in their daily lives. So in South Africa, we already had a youth brand called Springster, which we use for this campaign. So this brand had been consistently reaching out to young women between that same age group, so 18 to 24, with the messaging around sexual reproductive health. So in a way of creative design, we used a few content buckets when it came to COVID-19. 
One was the altruism nudge where we said behind every mask is a hero and heroes keep it clean with a, like an image of a person washing their hands. We also used memes because this is a young audience. We used community and family first messaging. So we said do it for them. I've also popped in some of the creatives on the slide, but overall we had a few more creatives per content bucket that we designed. And we had a fairly large budget for this this specific an audience because it was 18 to 24, only, only women in South Africa. So it was a really large budget. And it was very important that we did not expand on that budget because this was the brand's core audience. With this budget, we were able to reach about 1.24 million girls at an overall campaign frequency of 11. Now, this seems like a lot, but for behavior change campaigns, it's important that the audience sees this. The main metrics we were measuring were engagement. So we got about 60,000 reactions. We got 500 plus shares. We got 400 plus saves and we got 600 plus comments. And while these metrics were really important for us to look at overall campaign measurement and we looked at what content has been performing, what's not been performing, we were, really, we were mostly keeping a very close eye on the brand lift study results. And this is how a brand lift study result looks like. So Meta provides a view of how people in the control group, that is the people who have not seen the ads, answer the question versus those who have been exposed to your ads. So for each question, we can see how our audience who has seen the ads respond versus those who have not. That, and that in itself is a very impactful measurement metric for a campaign. It answers the question, how has your ads made a difference in, in this uh, topic? and actually shows the measurement through the study. Now, while the control group, with the control group, you can actually see that young women in South Africa were already well educated about mask wearing and social distancing and hand washing. We can see that through the high baselines for these questions among the control group. We can also see a high percentage of audience also reporting that they were practicing mask wearing and social distancing. Now, with these already high baselines, the challenge for us was, would we be able to measure a significant lift in knowledge and behavior change since the audience already seemed to be very well aware of this? But fortunately, as the campaign completed, and this was a six week long campaign, and besides the already high baselines that we were seeing, we were able to see a lift in uh, knowledge for hand washing and a lift in knowledge for uh, social distancing practices. Over to you, Julie. Yeah, a question for you just in looking at these results. In the results on practicing mask wearing, it actually went down for the test group. H how would you interpret that result? Yeah. In, 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 in recognizing that, um, you know, it went up in the other ones. What, when you get a result like that, like, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's actually sometimes it's, it's so sad to see a result that goes down, but this is a really good observation. So with this particular question in BLS, we actually already started off with a very high baseline. This means that our target audience is already convinced that this particular health behavior is something that, that they need to do. Since it's already about 90% and the 2% drop could just be about the question fair framing, but we know that the audience still knows because it's still about 90% that it's important to practice mask wearing. So we, we, we saw that it went down, but we focused on, on the ones that went up as well. Okay. I just want to point out two things about this kind of brandlet study. The one is what side you said on the previous slide, which was that when they were running the campaign, they actually went for a frequency that's quite a bit higher than what you would, if you just looked at best practices for running digital ads and frequency, 11 would say would be too high. People would say you're like saturating your audience. It's they're going to see your ad too many times. It's going to turn them off. But what Saichi said is really right that we see in health behavior change campaigns that it takes a lot longer and the decision-making progress process, pardon me, is more complex, complicated. And seeing the message more times is really what we need to see behavior change. So don't be put off by a frequency number like that. And if you're not doing advertising and you're disseminating information a different way, know that health behavior change needs many more touch points 
then so that's one thing. And then the second thing is both Saju and I were working on campaigns around COVID with with organizations that had these meta ad credits, which meant that we got a little bit of a insider view into the way Meta looks at these brand lift studies. And in their view, being able to list um, the percentage points by two was considered highly successful. Just to give some context for this campaign, a 6.3 percentage point increase in ad recall is huge. That is really significant. So what that means is that means that the ads that Saiju and her team were making in order to get people's attention around the topic were, were getting noticed. People remembered seeing them. And then you can see that we're at like 2.1, 2.1, 3.7. These are considered really high and successful numbers. So that was just something to keep in mind if you're reading about brand list studies or seeing any more information about them. Okay, this is where we deliver on our promise for affordable measurement tool. And part of the way we do that is with a little DIY, right? That's how we bring down the cost. So we can use a suite of much, much simpler tools. We're going to start with a pretty basic tool that you may be familiar with that actually does double duty as both a research tool and an awareness tool. And that is polling ad. So polling ads, I've mostly use them on meta platforms, on um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, primarily on Instagram. And Meta's ad platform allows you to create polls that appear as a little quiz. And so your audience um, takes the quiz and their answers are recorded so that you can analyze responses. A little bit like uh, a mini version of Saiju's chatbot that she showed earlier where people make a decision and then you can see which one they chose and that gives you information about their thoughts and feelings um, around the topic. So last year I used polling ads like this one to test attitudes towards the COVID vaccine in Cote d'Ivoire for a nonprofit that was helping the local government there roll out a series of vaccine pop-up clinics. And so we used these ads to learn how much folks trusted the COVID vaccine when compared to a common trusted vaccine that they have been familiar with for a long time. So in this ad, it was with the yellow fever vaccine. And we spent about $500 on ads to learn that the COVID vaccine hesitancy was um, higher in rural areas than in cities based on responses. So we saw that in rural areas, people said that they would be more likely to get the yellow fever vaccine than they would be to get the COVID vaccine. And this was right at the height of vaccine promotion uh, around COVID vaccine. And so that was interesting to us. And then in the cities, we saw that um, people were m more likely to be getting the COVID vaccine. And then, you know, the way the ad works is that then when the user clicks their answer, um, we get that as a poll. And then the ad serves up another image where you can deliver a key message. So in this case, it's a link to a map to find a local COVID vaccine pop-up clinic. So we were carefully geo-targeting these ads so that we get linked to hyper and local pop-ups. But this was just a great way to get information about how people were feeling around hesitancy and the vaccine and everything that is a little bit more engaging and interactive on social media seems to work a bit better. And we certainly saw that with these poll ads. Another great tool that we use pretty often and that can go significantly deeper than polls is multi-question surveys on third-party survey tools like SurveyMonkey. Obviously, with a multi-question survey, you can understand your audience um, around health topics or other topics much, much more because you can ask as many questions as you like. So in this example, we reached a target audience 
on Vancouver Island with Facebook and Instagram ads, and we asked them to fill in an online survey. You can see with the screen capture of this ad that we used an incentive here of a gift card to get people to take the survey, which I always recommend. And our goal with the survey results was to gauge both the need for housing near treatment centers, which is the service that this nonprofit offered, and awareness for that service. So our ads reached 50,000 people. We got um, almost 1,500 responses to the survey and just over 1,000 people made it all the way through the survey and finished the final question. So the cost per click through to the survey was 50 cents. And the cost per finished survey was in Canadian dollars, $1 and eight cents. So if you compare that cost with market research fees for doing surveys or like phone surveys, it is well below market, which is one of the joys of these DIY projects. So what did we learn from our survey? Some pretty illuminating results. We learned that in central Vancouver Island, 64% of those surveys had traveled for healthcare, either for themselves or their family. And that really demonstrated the need for overnight housing near medical facilities. The second chart shows us that very few of the people who were surveyed were actually aware of the housing facilities offered by the nonprofit that we were doing this work for. So that meant that the organization really was going to need to work a little harder to build awareness about its brand and its services. So the, sur the survey helped to make a case for the organization, something that they could share with funders, right? Our target audience has this problem. They, 64% of them are having to travel for health services. And so that helps, that helps maybe sharing that with funders and helps in sharing that with the board. It's just information about the need for those services. And then the awareness issue helped to set new prior priorities for promoting those services. A side effect also of doing these kinds of surveys is that you can ask respondents to opt in to receive emails and basically to support the organization at the end of the survey. And in our experience, opt-ins are a lot higher than you would expect, somewhere in the 40% range, which means if you get a thousand surveys, you're also adding about 400 people to your list if you've done a good job of bringing them through the survey, which is a great return on investment when you consider that you're also getting those survey results. So that's just, that's like a hap was a happy side effect of this work that we did. And, and we also did some follow-up work to see down the road how those new people who came on to nonprofit list perf opens, click rate, unsubscribes on kind of future emails that they receive from the organization. Um, and in a couple of cases, they performed about the same as other people on those organizations list. So that's my that's my super top tip for you today. Finally our last, our last tool we're going to share is a more sophisticated version of the surveys. And so if you're really keen on doing a brand list study, but you can't do it financially, this is a DIY version that we ran. It's a little complicated. Hang in there with me. But first, I'm going to tell you about C'est la vie. So C'est la vie is a serial drama that entertains and educates, and it promotes positive health behaviors in West Africa. So it can be viewed by fans on primarily on Facebook and YouTube. And so we worked with the C'est la Vie team and with some academics from Drexel University and UCLA to develop an experiment to determine whether content on C'est la Vie could, like in the story, as part of the soap opera, could change knowledge and attitudes towards the human Papilla, papillomavirus vaccine, so the HPV vaccine. So we ran a baseline survey that asked questions about the attitudes that people had 
towards the HPV vaccine. And then we advertised the Say La Vie episode that basically had a plot point around somebody getting the HPV vaccine. And then we could track which users clicked the link to the episode using the Facebook pixel. We did multi-step and we used a few different tools. And so we could say, okay, we've sent out this baseline survey through ads, just like I showed you with the Vancouver Island Health Organization. We got a bunch of responses. We then could, we actually made a custom audience in Facebook from those respondents. And we tracked how many of those, we advertised back to them, tracked how many of those actually went to look at the episode and how many didn't. And then we sent a baseline survey. So it was a little bit of experimentation and definitely not as easy as just like pulling out a meta or a YouTube tool, but it did actually work. And so I'm going to show you three results. So the first graph on, on the left shows that when we asked the baseline survey, about 47% of respondents believed it to be true that getting a vaccine to prevent HPV is safe. Percent of our target audience thought it was safe. The end line survey of people who did not see any of the ads or any of the episodes, as far as we know, or at least none of the episodes via our ads, because that those were the ones we could track, shows that the respondents who um, didn't see any of our campaign content had pretty similar results to the baseline. So that's to be expected. But if we pop over to the last circled results, then we can see that those who answered the endline survey and also had clicked through to the episode, we don't really know how much of it they watched, but um, if they clicked through to the episode, um, we can see that they agreed that the HPV vaccine was safer at a much higher rate than the baseline. With this do-it-yourself survey, we did demonstrate that we can increase the knowledge of a healthcare topic, in this case, the HPV vaccine, using what we called ed edutainment videos. You've probably seen this. It's like a combination of education and entertainment. And so this informed plans for funding and planning for future say levy. And we also learned that we can recruit survey respondents for healthcare surveys at a fraction of the cost than doing in the field approaches, such as going door to door or surveying in clinics, which is approach in West Africa. Um, and it's also an approach that we use in other parts of the world as well. So. I've been talking a lot about surveys, so I do want to share some of my favorite survey tools. And TypePad and SurveyMonkey are neither that difficult to use. They don't require a ton of expertise, and they are relatively cheap to use. They also have nonprofit pricing. So if you wanted to try to collect survey information, this is a way I would do it. I would pair some digital ads and what some of their concerns are, what some of their attitudes are towards what you're doing. And of course, when you do that, not only can you see if your like, current campaign is working or not, if you do a baseline and endline survey, but you just get to know them a ton better, which means that your messaging is going to be tighter. It means your creative for your campaigns is going to be better. And it means that what you show your audience is going to be more relevant to them. I think we can, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I think we have time for one or two questions. If anybody has a question that they would like to ask. That's super amazing. Thank you so much for walking us through in these campaigns and seeing how you can bring in these innovative approaches like chatbots or some very like standard classic approaches like a survey, a quiz to start helping people get a sense of like, where do we start with these baseline health like topics and where's the room for moving and, and changing behaviors. So we've had a couple questions come at us and I'd encourage people to keep throwing things into the chat for the next couple of minutes. But of course, everyone always starts off with the, I 
I'm a small, scrappy organization. You've thrown a couple different approaches at me here. Where, should, where would you recommend I start? Say yeah, I'm running a local health clinic and I am trying to get a sense of like how people want to engage with my services. Love small, scrappy nonprofits. That's, that's the most fun work and often like the most really impactful work. So I do, I'm going to ask you to comment on this, but honestly, I think a really easy way to start and like low hanging fruit is something that somebody stuck into chat a little bit earlier. And that is that if you have a Facebook page already, it might be interesting to set up a messenger chat bot in Facebook that maybe just touches on a few different things like how to make an appointment or somebody can maybe ask like a few different questions. And if you uh, want to, you can also advertise. You could spend a little bit of money on ads um, to push people to your messenger chat bot. And so that's cool because you get more information about your audience and it's not very hard to set up. And you can also see what topics they're most interested in. Saiji, so do, do you feel like that's the right fit for a small org? Yeah, definitely. I think just using social media itself as a tool to get to know your audience at the, and the various tools that's in social media, like Julian mentioned, polls, we have Facebook Messenger, just using all these tools to understand your audience better is always step one. Anything beyond that, like how we talked about brand live studies and um, these big chatbot projects, these are all something that you can aspire to as we as you grow. But I'm just understanding your audience with the tools that you have is always step one. Awesome. I've got another question here, which is, we've talked a lot about health organizations today. That was like the case studies we used. But can we use some of these same approaches with other kinds of organizations? So. I'm going to look here at Ben and say I'm working at a local nonprofit that is trying to reduce human grizzly bear or bear interactions. Correct, yes. um, we use some of these kinds of approaches for that kind of campaign work as well. Yeah, for sure you can. And we we Capulet does quite a lot of work with Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society and this surveying tactic is one we use a lot. It's got some good outcomes. I mentioned the list building effect of running surveys. There's also the media hook effect, which is amazing, right? You get a survey. You do want to have about a thousand respondents for it to be statistically significant, uh, but you run a survey about attitudes or knowledge or knowledge gaps around any topic, and then you can bring that to the media, which is always a nice way to use survey data. So I actually think in all the work I've done with nonprofits, which has moved from um, mostly environmental sector work into health, that health behavior change is probably the most challenging needle to move because there's, it's just so personal. And so I think if you take any of these ideas and put them onto another topic area, I think you'll find that they'll work for you probably more easily even than health. Cool. And we've got one minute left, which is when I then come to you and say, so what if I'm a local organization and I want to, and I want to work with Capulet? Like, how, yeah. how could I start that? Oh, well, you can email me at, I'll put my email right in here, at Julie at Capulet. And as Eli said, the at the start, we're really interested in remarkable, unique, creative, and interesting campaigns. Sometimes it uses these tools, and sometimes it is a giant blanket fort in downtown Vancouver. All creative ideas are welcome in Catholic, for sure, and as long as they're as long as they're nonprofit. Thank you so much, Julia and Saidu. Really grateful for your time here today. 